Hi, my name is Bob Taylor, and I'm your host for this segment of Arventura TV. I'm here today with my guest, Jason Meek, from the Turning Point Foundation. Thank you for being with us, Jason. Thanks for having me. Okay, the Turning Point Foundation, what, what is that all about? Well, Turning Point Foundation is coming up on its 30th year here in the community. Wow. Yes, it's uh, programs for behavioral health, but it encompasses much more. Uh, housing, uh, treatment, recovery, and a different whole onslaught of issues uh, that are addressed to, to deal with all the symptoms involved with mental health and, and families as well, and how to become an active member back in the community in a safe and stable manner. Well, you know, I just had some quick thoughts go through my head when you said um, homeless. I'm sure homeless can cause bad mental health, even if it doesn't start with mental health, especially if you're a family and you have those issues. It's Certainly. You're going to head, start heading that way real quick. Absolutely. Well, there's a lot of things associated from, uh, with mental health uh, with, with homelessness. I mean, you think of you're in a safe and stable environment, a place that you can call your own regardless if it's ideal or not. Just that you can be behind a closed door, have food, shelter, and clothing, and uh, uh, some belonging, at least for the time being. And then you remove all those things, and you're either in a car or on the street. You're trying to find a way to survive through the night. A lot of accompanying anxiety. And if the situation doesn't change after a while, you can feel helpless, which uh, typically leads to depression. So it absolutely impacts your emotional well-being. You know, there's been times where I've you know, in my past, I've had some rough stints, but I've never been where I didn't have a couch or something to sleep sure. on, and I'm sure, I'm sure that's just going to, um, especially for a family, as opposed to just, you know, I've seen homeless that just want to be homeless. You know, we've all seen those that just don't want to live in the house, that kind of thing. But I really feel bad for those that um, have no place to go whatsoever. And how can you do all of that still concentrating on the mental health issue? Well, it comes in a couple stages. So what you're doing is you're looking at, you're kind of triaging. What's the most important? What are the, the biggest factors that need the most attention first? And you kind of prioritize that. And we have found over years of studies that getting somebody off the streets, out of the elements, into a safe and stable environment, then we can really look at the person and the right. family as a whole and decide, uh, what, what course of action we need, find out the data and information that led to homelessness and hopefully come up with a plan in partnership with them on how to go forward to mitigate that and uh, get, get a sense of forward mobility again. But you first have to get people safe and stable. It's hard to think about uh, going to college or getting job skills training when you're starving or you don't have a roof over your head or your children's head. Right. Well, you know, you just answered that question. How do you drain the swamp when you're up to your butt in alligators? Well, yes. you started that. You, I mean, you, once you, you're homeless, you're not up to your butt in alligators anymore. You got a, a way you can work with somebody once sure. you get them off the streets. Sure. Okay, so what, is the, what kind of programs do you have that lead them to health once you get them in somewhere? Uh, it, it's a very important question. Because, uh, historically, we have treated everything kind of siloed, um, housing, mental health, and then physical health. And maybe there's a drug or substance abuse issue going on there. There might be legal issues. The whole conglomerate affects each other. Right. And so what we do is we connect people to, uh, we get services that help connect them with behavioral health. We get them on a list for homeless voucher programs or subsidies. Uh, we get them into job training if they're ready for that or you know, uh, education. But one of the most important things is getting them linked up with a primary care doctor. And what we found is that mental health issues are pretty much in tandem with physical health issues, and they certainly affect each other. Right, okay. Anybody with chronic pain after a while, you're going to feel depressed. You're going to feel anxiety. Is this ever going to end? Yep. Am I going to get better? The right. uncertainty of it all. And so what we do is we connect people with uh, health benefits, behavioral health, try to find a support system in terms of family, friends, maybe it's community groups, peer groups, people that are experiencing the same thing, as well as if there are some type of accompanying substance abuse issue as well. So we really try to address all things collectively, treat the person as a whole, and address their individual unique needs. So you're kind of the general contractor. So to speak, yes. You know, you bring in everybody you got to have to help you, knowing one person can't do it all on their own or one group can't, sure. so you bring in the different groups the ones that can help in any Absolutely. way with that person and, and put it all together. Okay, what is, 
just give me a quick little definition of a great success story for you. I, I have so many, which is, it's, in, it's incredible to I have. I can tell by the smile I, on your I, face. I was, you, that's there's what you're so in many faces about. that come to mind, you know, and it's incredible. Uh, I almost feel guilty by not going down the list, but we'd be here for a long time. Right. Uh, which successes do often come few and far between. But when you help volumes of people every day, and we're well over a thousand people a year, they, they, they do materialize. And we've had um, a gentleman who uh, had mental health strike him incredibly quick and incredibly hard and did not know how to deal with it, didn't have any family or friends that had either the same issues or training. Right. You know, not everybody, not everybody's a mental health practitioner. And so feeling left on his own, he had turned to substance and tried to, you know, as they call self-medicate. Uh, when that didn't work over a period of time, he really contemplated taking his own life. Just uh, to get away from his pain. Absolutely. That turned into a time, date, and place. Um, fortunately for us, fortunately for him and his family and friends, just prior to going through with, with this plan, he reached out. He went to the hospital, he got Good some months. care. And yes, and, and uh, ended up in one of our programs. When he got to our program, uh, he excelled so good at his own recovery. And I don't mean from substance abuse, I mean the recovery from life, from stress, it was his turning mental point. health symptoms, yes. And so he, he became so good at that and so engaged in becoming well, others noticed it and we noticed it. And so after a while he became far enough along in recovery, uh, we decided to offer him a job. Oh, what a success yeah. story is that? Yeah. Well, so it's one thing to study this stuff and go to school and practice it uh, for, for existentially, but it's another when you live it and you experience, you have a very unique experience. Right. And we feel that the people living it are the experts. Sure, we can come up with best practices, but they know what it feels like to receive those services. Right. So what better person who's actually conquered every day some of their recovery battles uh, to, to be a, a voice for us on how to implement treatment and programs. So long story short, he just kept going. He just kept progressing, he just kept promoting, and now he's one of our directors. Uh, he helps hundreds of people every year uh, what's, get what's help story? and treatment. Almost, almost and, teary thing. Yes, yes. It, it, it's a wonderful thing. And th these are the things that absolutely inspire the rest of us to keep, keep our efforts solid, keep our resolve firm, and continue to learn new things and practice the very best of what we know is out there. Okay, now, um, uh, a negative part of, um, of nonprofits and things that you want to do, people, some people just try to take advantage of a system, just don't want to move forward, just want somebody to take care yeah. of them. How often does that happen to you guys? And, and how, yeah. how, how, do you, how do you weed those out that really don't want the help, they just want to sure. be taken care of but play the part? Sure, that, that is unfortunate and it does happen. It's hard to quantify a number on that. Uh, it does happen and what we do is we do continual assessments, you know, and try to put people uh, in applicable programs. And if it doesn't fit, that you know, we, we shift until we find something that does work. Unfortunately, there are those out there that may or not, may not want to engage. Right. And we don't, as much as we love to and we care and we really want well for people, we don't have uh, the ability to steer people into their own discovery of that they need this or give them the motivation to. We can right. certainly try support and facilitate it and encourage. Um, but ultimately, the, the time is theirs, and when they're ready, they're ready. We just have to be there for that call and not waste, waste valuable resources and, and, not, the process. and not be an enabler. Enabling is a very tough one, and that is definitely a line you, you don't want to cross. Well, I think no. um, a lot of us, without actually realizing it, um, are enablers to a lot of people. I mean, yes. I think of kids as an example. You know, yes. you just want to do nothing but help them in any of way course. they can. But we spend so much time trying to give our kids the things we didn't have, we forget to give them the things that we did have. Right. And that enables yes. them to not yes. to grow as much as they should grow to, to do all the things they should do. Now, I'm kind of guilty of that with my grandkids. Yes. Well, people, uh, people want to do well, and they, they love sometimes unconditionally. Sometimes they love to a fault. Sometimes they want to help, and they might actually hurt the situation. Right. And, so learning how to be firm and fair 
uh, learn how to encourage and be a partner, but not do when somebody is capable. Learn how to empower somebody and not enable. Right. These are things that, that are a constant. Big difference. Yes, absolutely. Very important for somebody's overall success is that they learn to gain uh, some victories in there, that they've done it on their own. They can reflect and say, you know, I did this. I am capable. And I think if we love blindly, sometimes we have a tendency to take that joy and that, that victory away from them, inadvertently, of course. Right. And then, of course, turn our head the other way because we're feeling so good yes. about what happened. You know, I know they don't, no matter what programs you get involved in with the state or no matter what kind of government funding you get, I know it's not enough to run your organization. So volunteers, how, do you, how many volunteers do you count on over the course of the year helping in one way or another? Oh, uh, over 100 for sure. Okay. Uh, there's different events that happen throughout the year, every year, uh, that are calendared, and uh, they require volunteers. And then there's events that we're not, we didn't see coming, and, you know, and uh, may require 20 or 30 people. You know, we recently have, uh, we're, we're changing out some of our, our domes for uh, tiny structured type housing. And, you know, that requires quite a few people to help with tear down and set up and things like that. And we weren't predicting this. It is some, we got very lucky with an incredibly giving community, and we made good on it. And uh, thanks to, to volunteers, we, we made it happen a lot quicker. So you have your own little housing facilities, transitional yes. housing facilities. Yes, absolutely. Okay. They, they're, they're equivalent of tiny houses. You know, and um, they're, uh, it's called River Haven. It's a community uh, off, out by the harbor. And uh, there's 21 tiny house, they used to be domes, but now we're, we're, we're changing them out for tiny homes that have a much longer life, you know, 30 years. They're the equivalency of a house, a roof on a house, and uh, very solid structures. They People out there are taking more ownership of them. They're feeling more safe. Uh, and a place of their own while they transition in, into a permanent residency. So it's, it's an incredible, uh, incredible program with very high success rates in the 90 plus percentiles oh, of, that's of, of people mitigating mental health symptoms, legal issues, substance abuse, and transitioning into a place of their own. So it's a wonderful program. And I'm sure they're always full at all times with a big yes. waiting list. Oh yes, absolutely. Well, we just need more grounds to be able to do that kind of thing. Absolutely. With. Yes. You know, it's, I don't think you would ever run out of um, of people that need some kind of, I mean, I, and this is with an embarrassment that I say, but 40 years ago, I had a friend that come back from Vietnam a little bit with PTSD or something, sure. what we do, we'd laugh at him. Sure. You know, because we didn't understand sure. the problems at that time. Right. You know? And as more and more things come to light, we realize there's more and more people that do need our help to be able to live a good, solid life. Absolutely. And I, I think that service providers should shoulder uh, some responsibility here to educate the public. Like I said, I'm certainly not the guy you'd want to work on anything mechanically, I can assure you that. But when it comes to behavioral health, I have a solid background in that and skill set. And it's important that we, we clear up, those that can and have the background, clear up some of the misconceptions and steer people in the right directions into meaningful treatment right. and not continue with, um, you know, stories or, or little anecdotes that they've heard on what things really are without any evidence or proof of that, right. you know, continue to educate ourselves. And again, Turning Point has the ability to get out there and do community outreach and get families and friends, police departments, uh, city government entities to understand what behavioral health is and the impacts it has, and more importantly, where to go get help, where to get treatment. All right, we're pretty much out of time, Jason. Now, how do people get a hold of you and the Turning Point Foundation? One of the easiest ways, uh, especially when you're talking about getting a hold of in volunteers, is to look at our website. It's turningpointfoundation.org. Okay. And what's good about the website is we have several different programs. And I think when people want to volunteer, that they find something that's meaningful to them okay. because we have so many different programs going to the website, you can peruse it, find out what's uh, maybe meaningful to you and you want more information about, and we can go from there. Right. Thank you very much for being with us Thank today, Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. Right. Well, my name is Bob Taylor. I've been here today with my guest, Jason Meek from the Turning Point Foundation. Until next time, thank you very much.